There we go. Well, I've been in the book of Mark for I don't know how long. I was trying to remember how long it's been. It's been quite a long time. And I'm finally up to the last chapter of the book of Mark. So Mark chapter 16 for you children that are at home. No children here. Well, I guess we're all children, children of God. So the word of God is for everybody. And so we're up to the last chapter. Now, I don't think or probably you don't remember exactly what happened last time I was doing the children's lesson. But the last time I was doing the children's lesson was one of the saddest days in all of history. One of the saddest times this whole world had ever experienced, at least to some few individuals. That was when Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified, a man that was so loved by his followers that they thought that Jesus should be with them forever. And he was crucified, and they were very sad. And that's one thing that I realized that Jesus did, is he really, really had your emotions attached. You have your emotions attached to him because he made them very, very happy. And then when he died, he was very, the disciples and his followers were very, very sad. And so, that was one of the saddest times. In this last chapter is one of the most glorious and most wonderful, happy times of the time Jesus was on earth, and that was his resurrection. And so we'll be reading about the resurrection of Jesus Christ today and his ascension. In verse 1, it says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had, brought, uh, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint Jesus. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Now, interesting, they had prepared to anoint Jesus' body. They had wanted to anoint it in, in, uh, with spices and everything and, and to preserve it maybe longer or, or that was custom anyway that they would do that. They were walking there with all their stuff prepared. Then all of a sudden, look at verse 3. It says, And they said among themselves, Who shall roll away, roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? They hadn't even thought about that. As they're walking, all of a sudden they're thinking, oh, how are we going to get in? How, how are we supposed to get in the tomb? We didn't even think about that. And so they were walking, wondering, okay, what do we do now? So they continue walking, and then verse 4 says, And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. So it was rolled away. So it was a big stone. I don't know how big. I, I picture it maybe... This big, I don't know, somewhere around here. It was really big stone because the door was big enough for a couple of men, a couple of people to actually carry Jesus' body through that door. So it couldn't have been a very small door. And now maybe they had a little bit of struggle getting in, but it was at least big enough to where the, a man could, uh, maybe he has to duck, but to where he could go in to the door and carry another body in there. And so there was probably two or three or I don't know how many or four or five people. Who knows how many people were carrying Jesus' body into the tomb. So that's how big the, the opening was. And the stone was bigger than that so that we could cover that hole. And they had not thought about who would roll away the stone. But when they came, it was already open. And somebody already had opened it. And entering in, verse 5 says, And entering in, to the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. So they saw a man, they came in there, and they expected to see Jesus' body there, but instead they saw on the right side, they saw a man with long white raiment, long white robe perhaps is what I guess, that he was wearing, and there was no body. And they were affrighted, they were alarmed, they were kind of like, what? Where's Jesus' body? But there's a man here that's sitting there, but no body of Jesus. And he saith unto them, this man in the white, Be not affrighted, 
Don't look so shocked. Be not shocked. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, the place where they laid him. He said, look, they laid him right here, but he's not here. And I know one of, some of the other Gospels, they have a little more detail about, about what, happened, what all happened there. So he, this man in the white robe, he said, he is risen. He's not here. Look where they laid him. And then in verse 7 it says, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. So Jesus had told his disciples and his followers and even the Pharisees that he would die, be, uh, be crucified, and die and rise again. But they had not, it had not entered very far into their mind. They had not listened to that very well. And now here this man that was sitting in the tomb when they were coming in, he said, remember, this is what he said. Just as he told you that would happen, that's is what, this is what happened now, is happening now. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. You can just imagine how that would have felt, and you want to go and anoint this body, and you expect the body to be there, and then it's not there, and then this man tells them this, and the stone was rolled away, and all these things that just didn't seem like should have happened were done. And so they were running back. They, they just didn't talk to anybody. They just beelined it all the way back to the disciples and to Peter. And then in verse 9 it says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, now it's backtracking, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Interesting that Jesus made himself known first to a woman. And it's interesting that he first appeared unto a woman that had been filled with seven devils. And then the other interesting thing is, the last verse in chapter 16, if you look at that verse, it says, And Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. Mary Magdalene was one of the last ones that saw Jesus before he, when they laid him in the tomb. And he, she was the first one to see Jesus alive. And she said and told them, in verse 10, and she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. So, Mary Magdalene, and they, they come running to where the disciples were, to where the 120 perhaps were, and they were weeping, mourning. They were really sad still that their leader was not it was not anymore among the living, that their leader had died. So they were still sad and mourning and weeping. And so she comes there and she told them. And they, it says in verse 11, and they, when they had heard that, she, that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Did not believe. No, that can't be true. We laid him in there. He can't be alive. He was dead. We saw it. Can't be. And then in verse 12 it says, After that he appeared in another form unto two of them that were, as they walked, and went into a country. And there was two men that were walking, and Jesus appeared unto them and walked with them. So he's slowly getting himself known to more people. And then in verse 13, listen. And they went and told it unto the residue, unto the rest. Neither believed they them. So Mary Magdalene, the ladies, they came and told them, and they would not believe. Now these two that walked by the way, they came and told them, and they still didn't believe them either. And then afterward, in verse 14, it says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. While they were eating, all of a sudden, 
Jesus appears to them. And notice it says 11, not 12. There were 12 disciples, but here it says 11. Can you remember and get or guess why there was only 11? Many of you probably already know, because Judas Iscariot was no more. Now there was only 11 left. So it says, and afterward, again, verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them, which means rebuked them. Jesus was not very impressed that they would not believe. Rebuked them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Unbelief is called hardness of heart. If we don't want to believe the words of God, if we don't want to believe what Jesus said or what God's word says, it's hardness of heart. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So, God does not want us to believe something that's mythical or something that's way out, a pie in the sky, as they say, something that's unbelievable. I guess in one sense it can be almost unbelievable, but there were witnesses. There was actually witnesses that had seen Jesus alive. There was people that had seen him. And Paul actually says at one time, there was 500 people alive in his day that, still, that had seen Jesus, that still were alive. And so it wasn't that they were believing something that was not true or made up. It was actually they were, they had seen him. And so we are believing the history, the history of the Bible. Not because people made up stories, but because these things actually happened. So you children, when you look for something to believe, or when you see something, you need to see is it true or is it not true? If it's true, you can verify it, then you're supposed to believe it. And then in verse 15 it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now that you have seen it, now that you believe it, this is true, now go tell everybody. Go tell the whole world about Jesus rising from the dead. You know that's interesting that this is one of the things that makes our gospel, our belief, the Bible, the most profound religion in all the world. Why? Because Jesus conquered death. Jesus was actually risen from the dead. A lot of the other religions, prophets and everything, all these people that they follow, they died and stayed dead. But Jesus is the only one that rose from the dead and had power over, over death. And that's what we're all longing for one day, to be alive forevermore. I wouldn't want to put my trust in anybody less than the one that has the power over death. So go and preach this to every creature, to every creation, all the creation that Jesus rose from the dead. And verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So, we are to believe, it says believe and be baptized. We will be saved. But if we don't believe, we could be baptized, but if we don't believe, then we're damned. So we need to believe what we just read. And then verse 17, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. And these things are still happening. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so, many of these things, it seems like we don't see them so much around us, but yet there's miracles happening around us. There's still miracles happening in foreign countries. But even in our own land, there is people getting born again. Stone cold heart 
A stone-cold heart can be turned into a soft heart of flesh, as Jesus would call it. I'll take the heart of stone away from you and replace it with a heart of flesh. And then you will have love and you will have peace dwelling within you because of what Jesus' operation on you has done for you. So there are still miracles. And then it says in verse 19, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So this was now 40 days later from the time that Jesus was speaking to them in verse... uh, between verse 14 and 15, there was 40-day period, 40 days that he was with them yet. And then he went and was taken up to heaven and he went and sat at the right hand of God where he is waiting for us. And so, Jesus is, has left the earth and then at one place it actually says he gave us the spirit so we could have a comforter while he is gone. And we need this comforter. If Jesus had stayed on the earth, then he would still be probably in Jerusalem. He probably wouldn't be in Canada. He probably wouldn't be in the U.S. He probably, I don't know, maybe he would, but wherever he was, that's the only place he would be. But now that he went, he says, it's very necessary that I go to heaven because if I don't go to heaven, then I can't send the comforter to all the believers all around the world. Then it would be only a few people in one spot that could have the comfort of Jesus being around. And the rest of the world would not have that. But now he says, I have to go to heaven so that I can send the Spirit so the Spirit can be everywhere with all the believers. Now we all have the comfort of God with us every day, wherever we are. If we're lonely, we can rest assured the Spirit is with us. If we're in the middle of a big crowd of people, we can rest assured the Spirit is with us. And so, Jesus went to heaven, sat at the right hand of God, sent the Spirit down so that we could have the Spirit with us. And that is very beautiful. Verse 19, I think I read that, I'll read it again. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So, the people, after they saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ, after they saw that indeed he had power over death, they were not afraid to go and preach. Now, after they had received, uh, when they had seen that Jesus did actually rise from the dead, the Spirit, 10 days after Jesus went to heaven, the Spirit came down and filled them and gave them comfort. And so they were not fearful to preach. They would preach the gospel to everybody. Though the people didn't like it around them, they would still do it. And those signs that Jesus was talking about, they were confirming them that their message was real and true, that their message had power. And oftentimes today too, when there's a, a, a country that is not reached, a, a uh, jungle maybe where there's people still never heard of Jesus Christ and they have their own uh, rituals, magicians or whatever they have, when somebody goes and preaches there, Often there is signs and wonders happening for the preachers so that it will confirm and give credit to the message that these preachers are preaching to these lost people. Then those people all of a sudden see and realize, wait a minute, what he's doing is more powerful than what we have. What he is doing is what we're looking for. And very often they will come to Jesus Christ because they see the power and the credit that they have. And so... We should often tell our own testimonies to other people. Why? Because it's confirming that we, too, have been changed by the power of God. Who can deny a testimony? Who can deny somebody's story of change? 
that can't be denied because it's his story. And if somebody shares their testimony with you, you can't say, oh, that's not true. Well, it's his story. That's his life. That's what he experienced. So it is true. And so we do see confirming signs that way, and even in our day. And so that concludes the book of Mark. It's a beautiful ending. I really like the ending. The ending is with Jesus going to heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. In another Bible verses, it talks about him interceding for us as he's sitting beside God. So when we do something that we shouldn't maybe, then Jesus says, I died for that. Or when we, sometimes we don't know what to pray and we, we, we say, think, God, what do I say? And then you just kind of groan or whatever. It says there's interpretation for us to God from the groans that we can't even utter. And so that's a beautiful thing how this chapter ends and then it ends with us telling other people about the same thing. So I hope you enjoyed the book of Mark. I really have enjoyed it myself and I hope you are blessed and I hope you have a blessed day. May God be with you.